Our next interview will be with a documentary maker who made a film which is all about silence. So we're going to play a bit of Bjork. This is It's Oh So Quiet. And that was Bjork with It's Oh So Quiet. We're going to be right back. Just listen. Can you hear that? What? Exactly. The sound of silence, Andrew. It's what we're going to be hearing about for our next guest. He's Patrick Shen, a documentary maker from the US whose latest film is In Pursuit of Silence. It looks at why a bit of peace and quiet is fast becoming one of the rarest luxuries out there today. The cities become ever more crowded and lives become ever more intertwined with technology. Shen speaks to everyone from Japanese tea ceremony masters to a man walking in total silence across the USA and also visits an anechoic chamber too, a site engineer to produce a background volume of minus 9.4 decibels. Monocle's Tom Hall spoke to Patrick about the film a little bit earlier. I've always been drawn towards the quieter nature of our experience on the planet. And so even as a teenager, that's I've always been drawn towards, uh, I guess you could say, kind of this existential kind of realm. And that's where kind of silence initially kind of came into the conversation for me. But then as I, as I got older, I also realized that I didn't have much quiet in my life. And so life got busier. I had uh, children. And so my house became noisier. And I found that I just couldn't escape noise ever, even if I wanted to. And that was, um, it it was worrisome for me. And I didn't know what I was kind of missing out on. um, And I became very curious about it. And I think in this day and age, it's especially important to kind of talk about simply just stepping away. Pico Iyer, the writer, talks about how our lives are like this, this huge canvas, but that all of us are standing just an inch away from it. And uh, we're doing all this work to kind of make the world go round, and that's important to maintain. But we leave little room in our lives to think about the things that will actually move it forward. And there's there's real sort of evidence in the film from notable experts, but a few of them are saying things sort of akin to, um, say, like time spent in a forest. It's not necessarily all about the silence, but the environment, it contributes to well-being, it contributes to your immune system, it, it de-stresses you. I mean... Do you think that we are around invasive noise far too often in our modern lives? Absolutely. I mean, the noise is, uh, especially for those of us who live in cities, it's literally all around us and we have no respite from it. There's the sort of industrial noise, the commercial noise that's introduced into our cities, but then there's also the noise of technology, isn't there? You know, we we go from one notification to the next, and there's never a break from whether it's actual sonic noise or these sort of interruptions in our day, interruptions in our consciousness, in our engagement with what what it is that we feel like we should be doing day in and day out. It's become a real problem, and, and I think all these industries are making these products and introducing these industries into our communities with no regard for how the sound or noise of these things are impacting us. And the film is obviously, you know, noise and silence. It's a universal thing. It, it looks at it all over the world. But one of, the, one of the places it returns to a couple of times at least is Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, and Japan seems to have um, quite an interesting relationship not with noise, but with silence, with maybe pursuing it culturally in maybe a slightly more sophisticated way than Mm -hmm. other nations. Is that something that you picked up on early or is that something that you kind of discovered as a happy accident through your research? Or, you know, was that something you were aware of before you made the film? No, not to that extent. I knew that Japanese are often very extreme with the things that, that they find interesting. And silence was no different but yeah, it was in the research that we had discovered kind of to what extent that uh, silence is, permeates their culture, their way of life. It really kind of dates back to their, their Buddhist roots. It's kind of become entwined with their culture. Even for those who are not religious uh, or spiritual in Japan, silence is still kind of there. It's a presence in the way that they are, the way that they interact with the world and engage with it. And the, the tea ceremony is kind of the epitome of that 
when it's done correctly, I think it's a four hour ceremony right. of uh, this performance in like meditation on silence. And it's very, it's really intense and yeah. it takes a lot of discipline to kind of sit through, let alone, you know, host one of those activities. But it's, it's a beautiful expression of silence. Um, every sound and every movement in these tea ceremonies orchestrated and very intentional. Yeah. Yeah. It's not so much also about the, um, I mean, even though there's a really nice detail of the design of the film, every location you mentioned, there's a little decibel rating of uh, everywhere you go. And that's, <laughs> that's a really fun thing. But um, it's not simply about the sound itself. It's about how people interact with sound, but also people's, a lot of people are uncomfortable with silence, aren't mm. they? Some people can't handle it. And is that something that you think ties into our sort of modern obsession with being occupied and being uh, distracted permanently. I mean, do we need to relearn how to engage with sound in a healthy way? I think we do. I think we do. And I think our fear of silence is very much tied to, you might say, our addiction to technology. I spent a lot of time in anechoic chambers, much like Cage did in the 50s. And they were definitely loud experiences for me. I spent time in, in one in particular that was negative 13 decibels, so 13 decibels below the human threshold of hearing. And all I heard was my, my own kind of inner voice in that room, and it was, it was kind of driving me a little mad. I was intent on spending 40 minutes because others have reported uh, having gone mad after spending 40 minutes in these rooms with the lights off, sensory deprivation. And it took me th literally probably about 30 minutes of that time just to kind of quiet my mind. And it was really annoying. It's like, you know, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, having like that, that annoying uncle that just won't shut up at the table, you know, it's like it's but it was myself. And it's and so I think often when the white noise of the world falls away and we're left with our own voice, we often find that 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 narrative that we're kind of pushing and constantly um, promoting in our minds is kind of empty. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to talk about those, those chambers as well because um, I kind of wasn't that aware of their existence before watching the film. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that you think about too much. But uh, yeah, there's a great bit where John Cage again is saying, I think he or someone was talking about John Cage and he went into one and he could hear two... Uh, sounds and and he mm. came out and he and he said to the engineer like why can I hear two and I think the engineer told him that one is just the pure sound of his nervous system in gear and the low sound is his blood, blood circulating yeah. circulating around his body <laughs> which is nuts but um, I mean tell us a little bit about what these chambers are how do you how do you achieve negative sound what is that sure yeah so anechoic chambers they exist on many campuses university campuses around the world uh, specifically those with acoustic departments that are interested in measuring the sound impact or the sound footprint of a particular item or product or something. And so these aren't publicly available spaces. They're often private on universities or private testing facilities, but they're made to be nearly soundproof. They're 99% soundproof. And they're often uh, very, very thick walls and built within a, a room of itself in itself and then uh, no flooring in place either. It's often like this kind of mesh flooring and then more soundproofing material underneath. It's just insane. Like it's, it, it's like this, uh, it feels like it's medieval torture chamber of sorts. It's a very weird, disorienting place to be in. And one thing I was watching early on when I was watching the film, because there were, there were people in the film sort of saying, um, oh, our, our bodies aren't really built for this like level of sound and it's and it's something very new that our bodies are adapting to and i was kind of sitting there like a little bit cynically because i i'm i'm quite a big fan i like to think i'm a big fan of sound i mean i, I don't think i'm a big fan of like sort of incessantly invasive and pollu polluting sound but i like the the sound of a city i like the fact that i can hear people outside on the street and i like to know that other things are going on and i was sort of reading it a bit myself and sort of thinking I'll get used to it. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's there. It's mm. around. But then later in the film, there's this point about how, according to one of the guys in this film, he, he, he says that it takes us like at least 10 to 30,000 years to start to evolve. Yeah. So really, yeah, we, we are still, because this sound, this level of sound has only really emerged in the past few hundred years at least. And yeah. we're, we're not ready for this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it's, right. Is that sort of something that you think is actually sort of biologically important within us, that we're just not kind of ready for this step up? 
Yeah, I think so. I think so. You know, you find all these studies supporting this idea that uh, we often find ourselves uh, much calmer, our blood pressures even kind of dipping down and all the sort of stress markers coming down amidst the sounds of nature versus the, these, this artificial kind of environment that most of us find ourselves in. And so I think there's a lot to that. Because we, yeah. uh, the film makes a point of sort of saying that silence was vital thousands of years ago because it was the thing that we sort of, you know, we hunted in and we needed to know uh, what was around us, like, even just for survival, you know. So That's it's, right. So yeah. it's like we're very highly attuned to it and now it's kind of disappearing. Yeah, I mean, now we're, we're sort of uh, trying to move ourselves away from sound, right, and shield ourselves from sound, whereas it used to be that, that we needed sound in order to understand where we were, understand whether or not there are any threats in the environment. Um, but now we just kind of put the earbuds in, you know what I mean, and tune it all out. I think it's a very strange dynamic for our bodies. And again, all the studies kind of support that, that uh, you know, it's causing this incredible stress on our bodies. And, you know, the WHO even goes as far as to say it's killing us. And uh, I mean, there, and there's points made in the film about, say, bars in New York, where they're now at a level where, according to health organizations, the staff there should be wearing ear protectors. I mean, mm-hmm. it's funny, isn't it? It's <laughs> it's something like it's all to do with context, I guess. You kind of accept that if you go to a bar, but maybe on paper, it's not actually the right environment for us to be sort of making our lives in, you know? Well, I mean, we all know it, right? And we've all been to a bar or a loud restaurant where where we want to kind of hang out with some friends or or family or whatnot, and and we're expecting to kind of connect with this person and have a conversation with this person. But all we do is we find ourselves struggling to hear one out of every 10 words um, and using up all that kind of cognitive energy that we could be using to connect uh, just to kind of you know, make out the words that the, <laughs> that's coming out of the other person's mouth. And we find at the end of an hour meal or whatever that we're exhausted and we're drained. And it's because we're working so hard just to kind of hear the words that are coming out of the other person's mouth. And it's just an inhuman kind of environment that I think we've created for ourselves. Finally, I mean, you've, you've made um, some really unusual films. You, you, you made a film about people's kind of relationship with death a few years ago. Yeah. And um, you also, as I understand it, I, I haven't seen the film, so I hope I've got it right, but you did a film about janitorial stuff. Is that right? The, the that... wisdom of janitors at yeah, uh, yeah. universities in That's the United fantastic. States. <laughs> um, what are you working on You know, in the future? What ideas are you kind of, without giving the game away? I mean, I, it sounds like such an interesting trajectory you're on filmmaking wise what's on the horizon yeah i've got some equally strange films i think on the horizon i've was incredibly influenced and inspired by john cage during the making of in pursuit of silence and he said uh, i came across a quote of his that really got me thinking he said that uh, if you're bored with something after two minutes then try it for four and I thought, well, that's a really interesting sort of commentary on, on boredom, right, and how we kind of interact with boredom and, and how we treat boredom in, the, in this culture, in this day and age. And so I had the idea of making a film that uh, consists of four-minute shots. So it'll be 17 four-minute shots depicting aspects of our life that we often sleep through, us modern people sleep through, moments of our lives that we kind of relegate to the unimportant or the forgettable. And... Uh, yeah, I'm hoping to, with that film, maybe as, uh, ask people to kind of re-examine those parts of our lives that we deem forgettable yet comprise most of our lives, most of our days. So anyway, it's a personal film that um, that I'm just trying out. I'm curious about it, and I, and I want to do it kind of on my own, low-budget style, and I'll shoot it myself. It's in part kind of detox from having spent three years of my life on, on a film and having to do all the fundraising and the marketing that goes with it and just kind of wanting to get back... Uh, to the, the root of things, I guess. That was Tom Hall speaking to Patrick Shen and In Pursuit of Silence is available on iTunes right now.